Hello everyone, thank you for joining our pelvic girdle pain webinar. My name is Stephanie Gillespie, I'm the um, musculoskeletal physio service lead uh, for East Berkshire and today we'll be having the presentation delivered by um, Mel Lambert who is one of our clinical specialists and um, also works as a first contact practitioner out in GP surgeries. Okay so I'm going to hand over to um, Mel now. Thanks for that Steph. Um, so welcome to this online digital webinar on pelvic girdle pain and um, thank you for taking the time out of your morning to come and listen to me speak. Um, so before I worked in this role I was part of a pelvic health team for quite a few years um, so it's given me quite a lot of experience with treating women with pelvic girdle pain both during pregnancy um, and also after pregnancy. So the things that we're going to cover, we're going to look a bit into anatomy. So what happens with the pelvis and um, what the structures that are involved and um, what can cause pelvic girdle pain or PGP. That's how I'm going to be referring to it and um, the changes that happen during pregnancy and um, what things you can do to help yourself and if things don't improve and um, what is the next step basically. So before I get into that, I'm just going to play a quick video to give you a little bit of an overbrief and then we're going to a little bit more detail. Back and pelvic pain during pregnancy. Pain that limits day to day activities during pregnancy is not normal, but it is common. This pain may be around the pelvis or the lower back, bending down, lifting things, doing activities on one leg or spending a long time in one position may make this worse. Here are a few things that may be useful in managing this pain. Regular exercise is important. Choose something that does not aggravate your pain. Change position regularly and follow the advice on posture. Use heat, such as a hot water bottle, on the lower back for 15 minutes. This should be wrapped in a towel and never be on the bump. Sit down when getting dressed. Try walking with shorter steps. Keep your knees together when rolling over in bed and squeeze your buttock muscles to help lift your hips and pelvis as you turn. Postural changes are normal during pregnancy as your bump grows and you gain weight. It's also normal to gain around 15 kilograms during pregnancy. Hormonal changes also allow your body to become more mobile. If you have ongoing pain that's not resolved during or after your pregnancy with this advice, please speak with your midwife or GP and they may refer you to physiotherapy. So just following on with that, we're just going to go into a little bit more detail about the, some of the things that were mentioned. So to begin with, we want to talk about what the pelvic girdle actually is. Um, so people will think that the pelvic girdle is part, part of their back, whether it's due with the hip joints, but actually it's the part that's in the middle. So some people will call it the pelvic girdle, some people it will just be the pelvis. You may have heard of things like the sacroiliac joints and also the pubic symphysis. So when we have a look at the pelvis, at the front of the joint here, you can see the symphysis pubis joint. It's really common to get pain around there and you might have been told that you've got SPD. If you're looking around the back, you've got two joints at the back. So you've got both of your sacroiliac joints that are here and then you've got a lot of ligaments that hold that joint in place. Um, the main role of the pelvis is to transfer weight between your upper body and from the trunk into your legs. So when you're walking, what tends to happen is that your pelvis will swing from side to side. So it's not a hinge joint, it's more of a swinging motion. Is that, that's what we want to think about. Um, it's really important with balance and also transferring load between the right side of your body and the left side of the body as well. Um, in normal day life, when you're not pregnant, it's normally very, very stable because of all of the ligaments and also because of how the joints fit together. If you imagine a jigsaw puzzle and think of how they all slot together and there's very little movement, that's what happens with the pelvis. But then when we think about adding in hormones, when you're pregnant, you get more movement than what is kind of normally expected. So just following on from that, um, what is pelvic girdle pain or PGP? So the terminology has changed over the years um, and now we tend to use PGP as an umbrella term. So basically it means there's a, any pain around the pelvic region. So this might mean having pain at the front of the pelvis. It may mean having pain around the back. 
but it's also very common to get pain around the hip joints, around the inner thighs and down the front and backs of the legs, like you can see in the diagram on the presentation. Um, it can start at any stage in pregnancy. Some people will get it very, very early on um, and will only realise they're pregnant because they start getting this kind of strange pelvic pain symptoms. Um, some people won't get it till the very last um, sort of month or two months towards the end. And some people actually won't have much during pregnancy, but then after they've delivered, they start having this pelvic pain. So it's not unusual to have it just after pregnancy. Um, and there's some things that we'll cover um, within the presentation that should help both during pregnancy, but also in that postnatal period. So we talk about how common it is, and actually it's very, very common. Um, so overall, there's about 50% of women um, will have either back or pelvic pain during pregnancy. And of these, 20% of the women will have pelvic girdle pain. And like I said before, it will um, vary in severity from an individual to an individual. So no two people will have exactly the same symptoms. And it also change from pregnancy to pregnancy. So if this isn't your first pregnancy um, and you've had pelvic pain previous, it may not be the same symptoms this time around as what you had first time. Um, or it may be exactly the same. You may know exactly what you're dealing with and what you're facing. Um, in the majority of the women, the pain will often start as mild discomfort or an aching sensation, and that it usually reaches its peak intensity in the third trimester. Um, but not always, it depends if they seek treatment early on or whether they um, start doing more exercise, it may lessen, but in the grand scheme of things, it's likely that things can get worse towards the end of pregnancy. Um, there's a high occurrence in future pregnancies, so it's estimated to recur in 68 to 85% of future pregnancies. But I guess on a positive note, 95% of women who have experienced PGP um, will mostly be free of symptoms by three months post birth. So there is a small percentage of people that have ongoing symptoms and will need ongoing treatment, but the majority of people, it will get better. So just moving on to the symptoms of PGP. Um, so some of these you might notice or recognise in yourself. They might be things that you've either heard of or you've known with family members and friends, and you may not have all of these symptoms. Um, but these are the most common ones we tend to see and hear about. Um, so a shuffling gait pattern. So really what we mean is not being able to take a, a big stride when you're walking. So you may find that you're taking smaller steps. You may find that your base of support, so your legs are a little bit wider apart when you're walking and that you're kind of adopting that pregnancy waddle and um, which is kind of characteristic of being pregnant. Um, you may have problems with weight bearing through one leg, with going up and down the stairs, um, Definitely with turning over in bed, that's one of the most common things that I find and people are always asking about advice about how to turn over in bed without having horrendous pain. You may notice clicking or grinding sensations within the pelvis and these might be things that you feel yourself or, or actually things that you can hear. Um, you may notice that your sleep is definitely deprived, you're struggling to get comfortable um, and you may have some hip pain on the outside because you can't get comfortable when you're in bed. Some people will get sciatic type pain, so pain down the backs of the legs. Usually it doesn't go below the knee, but in some people it can go a little bit further. Um, pain with long periods of sitting or standing and difficulty from um, transference of weight. So going from a sit to stand position, getting off the toilet, getting in and out of bed, on and off the floor, all really, really common. And in general, you'll just have some discomfort with routine daily activities, so household chores, so hoovering, washing up, hanging up the washing, um, getting dressed and also getting in and out of the car. So hopefully we're going to cover some of these in um, ways that you can try and help yourself and how's the best way to manage it. When we talk about causes of PGP, so there's no real knowledge of what actually causes it, but there's a lot of things that influence and can contribute to having pelvic girdle pain. 
Now, as I said to you before, 50% of people will get some kind of pain, but there's also a lot of people that don't get any. And it's sometimes very hard to understand why it might be happening to yourself, but it may not be happening to other people. So there is some things that we do see as common themes of what can be causing you to have pelvic girdle pain. So postural habits, we as physios tend to go on about posture quite a lot, um, but I probably don't talk um, any less about it during pregnancy. If anything, this is one of the most important times to really look at your posture. Now, when you have your posture in day to day life, when you are not pregnant, your body is probably quite well adjusted and it knows how to move and the muscles know how to activate. However, when you are pregnant, things do change. Your posture will change and then it throws your body out a little bit. So it's quite common to have some muscles that don't work hard enough and other muscles that tend to work too much. Um, mechanical changes. So this really kind of fits in with the posture. Um, so we'll be coming on to this, but essentially your centre of gravity will shift from the middle part of your body because of the growing bump. It will shift forwards, which will bring you forwards. So we will end up changing our posture and changing how we kind of sit and stand to try and stop that from happening. What we've also got to think about is all of the joints around the pelvis are going to have a little bit more movement and may well get some irritation and some inflammation around there um, to do with all the laxity that's going on within the ligaments. So coming on to hormonal influences. So there's three key hormones in pregnancy. So we have estrogen, progesterone and relaxin. So you may be aware of these. So a woman will produce more estrogen during one pregnancy than throughout her entire life when not pregnant. Its main role is the transference of nutrients across the placenta and supporting the developing baby. It's also the main cause of nausea and morning sickness. Estrogen levels increase steadily during pregnancy and reach their peak in the third trimester. Progesterone levels are also extraordinarily high during pregnancy. The changes in progesterone cause a laxity um, or a loosening of the ligaments and joints throughout the body. Um, and it's also important for transforming the uterus from a small a size of a small pear to um, a uterus that's big enough to uh, accommodate a full term baby. And then thinking about relaxing. So relaxing relaxes the wall of the uterus by inhibiting contractions and prepares the lining of the uterus for pregnancy. So during pregnancy, relaxing levels are at the highest in the first trimester. At this time, it's believed that it promotes implantation of the developing fetus into the wall of the uterus and the growth of the placenta. This hormone also loosens the ligaments, so it works well with the progesterone and can be a cause of pelvic pain from as early as six weeks after conception. So as you can see, with all of those hormones going on, there's just so many changes and all those ligaments that are around the pelvis, um, you can expect there's going to be some excess movement that wasn't there before. Now, the other thing to think about with those hormones is actually it doesn't just play a part in the pelvis and, and around the internal organs. It's also going to have some effects on your other joints. So it isn't unusual to have problems with your knees and your ankles um, during pregnancy also. So just bear that in mind when you're thinking about having other joint pain. It could be to do with that. So going on to changes in muscle length. So as you can see from the image below, you've got three layers of your tummy muscles. So you've got your six pack muscle on the front, you've got your middle layer, which is your obliques, and then you've got your very innermost layer, which is your core. So all of those provide a lot of stability and support to the pelvis and to the trunk. Um, as you can see, during pregnancy, those muscles start to lengthen and elongate and they can become very weak. And as we get towards the end of pregnancy, as you can see on the picture on the right hand side, we can sometimes get a small separation with those muscles. Now, those muscles aren't separate in terms of there's a hole in the middle. You actually have some tissue in the middle that just stretches and means that the muscles can't work as well as what they normally would. 
So if you once had very, very strong abdominal muscles, you may find during pregnancy, they're not doing as well because they're not in a, in a great position. They're being stretched and they're being put under a lot of load. So as well as the muscles at the front, we often find that the muscles in the lower part of the back become very short and tight because they're overworking. And then also the pelvic floor muscle down below in the pelvic region can also become quite weak. Other causes include um, pre-existing back or pelvic injuries. So if, if you've had previous problems with back pain or pelvic pain prior to pregnancy, it is very likely that your pain will be exacerbated during pregnancy. Um, having a high BMI, so this is before becoming pregnant, but also if you end up putting on quite a lot of weight during pregnancy, that, that shows that actually can make pain a little bit worse. And again, this comes down to your muscles not being as well conditioned, but also because of that change in posture and that change in your centre of gravity. And the last thing that we see quite commonly is hypermobility. Now, this is a syndrome where you already have a lot of elasticity within your soft tissues. So you may have been told that you do have this or it may be something that you have heard of. Um, but in general terms, it, it generally means that your tissues have more elasticity. So you're generally quite flexible. And then during pregnancy, it's likely that your muscles are going to have to work a lot harder to try and stabilise around the pelvis. So as you can see in this diagram here, so we're just following on um, to posture. So on the left hand side, you can see what a kind of normal posture looks like. So the spine is in an S shape. You've got a small curve at the lower part of the back and a small curve towards the top. You have a slight tilt within the pelvis and that's that's quite normal. Now, if you look towards the middle of the screen, you'll see um, how the posture adapts through pregnancy. So on that lower part of the back, you can see how the curve is slightly more exaggerated and then towards the top and around the just before the neck. Again, it's more exaggerated, so it can get you to start to understand why you might have some pain within these regions. Now, I'm just going to play another video, just give you a little bit more of an overview before we carry on. Posture and positioning during pregnancy and following the birth of your baby. Here are some simple tips to help you look after your body during pregnancy. Sitting. Keep both feet flat on the floor and your hips in line with your knees. A roll towel placed behind your back can improve comfort. Sit to stand. Come to the edge of the seat. Bring your feet under your knees and lean forwards. Squeeze your bottom muscles and pull in your stomach muscles as you stand. Avoid twisting. Standing and carrying. Stand up tall. When lifting objects, make sure you bend your knees and keep the object close to your body. Try to avoid carrying things repeatedly on the same side. Sleeping. Lie on your side with a pillow between your knees and ankles and under your bump. Alternating between your left and right sides can help. Or you can sleep on your back as long as you're propped up so your shoulders are above your hips by at least 45 degrees. It's advised, if comfortable, to try and fall asleep on your left side especially after 28 weeks. Don't worry if you wake up in a different position. Getting out of bed. Roll onto your side by keeping your knees together, squeezing your bottom muscles, pulling in your stomach muscles and pushing through your feet to help you turn. Let your legs come over the edge of the bed and push up to a sitting position with your arms. Following birth, it's important to look after your back. Try the following. If changing your baby, try to use a surface at waist height. If you're using a bed or floor to change or bath your baby, then kneel down. This will prevent you from stooping forwards. When feeding your baby, use a supportive chair or sit well in the bed. If breastfeeding, bring the baby to your breast and use pillows underneath the baby so that you're not bending forwards. If sitting in a chair, make sure your feet are well supported on the floor and the baby is well supported and can't fall. So we're just going to cover some of that in a little bit more detail. OK, so we're just moving on to standing posture. So like it mentioned in the video and like I said to you before about the changes that happen. So as you can see on that right hand side is that really exaggerated curve. So in the middle part where your lower spine is, instead of it being a very gentle curve, it's more exaggerated. 
And then especially in between the shoulder blades, you can have a more exaggerated curve there. And then we also tend to lock the knees out because that's the easiest way to stop ourselves from falling forwards. So if you can look on the left hand side, it's very small adjustments actually to try and put in stay stay life. And um, so you can try and standing a little better posture. So the first thing to try and do when you're standing is to make sure that you are not locking your knees out. There should be a very soft bend within them. Um, you should feel that the majority of your weight in your feet is in the ball or just below the ball, so where the arch is. It should be equally distributed on your left and your right hand side. So these are important things to try whilst you're at home and then you can build that into daily life when you're waiting in a queue for something um, or if you are having to stand for any reason because there's nowhere for you to sit. Try to get your tummy um, to be tucked in very slightly. So we want to engage those, those deep core muscles, but we also want you to tuck your bottom under a little bit as well. So you want to avoid that exaggeration of that lower lordosis of the spine. Um, and then just moving on to the head and neck, um, what we tend to do is bring our head and shoulders quite far forwards. This can create quite a lot of tension around the back of the neck and the shoulder blades, and it can be a cause of headaches. So similarly to standing, we also want to look at sitting posture. So depending on whether you're sitting in a supported or an unsupported position, we want to make sure that we're using our muscles effectively and not overworking some muscles around the pelvis and overloading the ligaments. So as you can see on the left hand side, with somebody unsupported sitting into the slouched position, there's certain areas that are going to be overloaded and those are commonly the back of the pelvis, the mid part of the spine, but then also the top of the spine before you get to the neck. And if you can see on the middle point how those small adjustments um, can make a big difference to the position and how your joints are being loaded. If you are sitting in a supported chair, so an office chair because you're working from home, then try and make sure that you have your feet flat on the floor um, you can have a, a stool or something underneath them just to make sure that your legs aren't dangling and then also have either a folded or rolled up towel just to place on the small of your back just to make sure we're recreating and supporting that, that natural curve that you have. So another thing that people often find is very difficult is either the getting in and out of the bed and um, the turning over in bed and generally just getting comfortable. And you may have bought lots of different things, different pillows, big long ones, and still not be able to find an effective way to get comfortable. And um, so what I will do is I will um, attempt to demonstrate in a second how you can try to move in bed. Now, I will say there isn't a one answer. There isn't a perfect way of doing it, but there are some things that you might not have thought of, might not have tried and um, that you can try that might make it a little bit easier for you. So I'm just going to do that demonstration now. So first of all, if we're sitting on the bed, what we want to try and do is avoid twisting movements around the torso and around the pelvis, because that is going to increase your pain. And usually it's going to affect how you're moving. Your muscles aren't going to be very happy. Your joints aren't going to be very happy. So we want to try and avoid that as best as we can. So the easiest way to do it is when you're sitting on the edge of the bed, you're going to come down onto your elbow on one side. But at the same time, you're going to bring your knees up together. So it's almost like a pendulum action. So as you go down, you want to bring the knees up into a sideline position. And that's how we should get in. And then getting out of the bed should be in reverse. So you're going to bring your legs over the side and push yourself up with your arms. Now, when it comes to turning over in bed, there's a couple of options. So the first option you can try is the conventional turning as if you're turning over to face the ceiling. So the best way to do that and the important things, again, are keeping your knees together, 
you're going to make sure you're squeezing your buttock muscles and pushing through your feet and your hands. So try again avoiding the twisting movements um, where you're pivoting on one leg. So I'm just going to demonstrate that for you now. So we're going to get into bed the same way as we did before. So we're going to come down. Then we're going to keep the knees together, use our hands. We're going to squeeze our bottom and lift up. OK, and that's how you turn over. Again, just coming back. We're going to take our arms over, legs over the edge and push up into sitting. Now, if you find that it's still very difficult for you, there is another option. If you're if you've got space, I would say in your bed, it probably takes a little bit more space, but that's OK. So the other way that you can do it is when you are on your side. It's a turnover facing the mattress, OK? So you're going to come up. You're going to push onto hands and knees and then turn over. OK? So I hope that makes a little bit more sense with how to turn in bed. The other option that you can try with getting in and out is if you don't have an end at the end of your bed, crawling up from the bottom towards the top. So those are all things that you can give a go and see if that will help. OK, so we're going to move on to the next slide. So other activities that you might find um, very difficult to do and things that I would advise you to try and um, do differently. So getting in and out of a car, what we tend to do is bring one leg out to the side. And again, that's giving a twisting, pivoting movement throughout the pelvis and around the hip joints. So if we're trying to keep our knees together and have a swivel type movement, that's generally recommended. So you want to sit your bottom in the car first, keep your knees together or take very small steps, keeping your knees together and bring your legs back into the car. Same applies as when you're getting out. OK, you may find it easier if you've got a shopping bag or something that's a bit more slippery to sit on just to do that movement. Um, but do make sure you take that out of the way before you start driving. In terms of getting dressed and putting on shoes and socks, make sure you sit down to do this. Reason being is when you're standing up, one, your balance is affected, so we don't want anyone to have any falls, but then also you're putting more load through one side of the joint compared to the other one. And this tends to give a bit of a shearing force and can cause pain around the back of the pelvis and around the front. So we do advise trying to sit down to put any kind of clothing, shoes, socks, trousers on. And housework. So I, I appreciate that we all have to continue doing some element of housework. Um, but there are some uh, tasks that I would normally say to try and either avoid, have some help to do or to try and limit how much you do in one go. So these include more repetitive movements. So things like hoovering. So there's a lot of twisting during hoovering and it's very repetitive. So if you are going to do that, try and do one room at a time rather than the whole house in one go. Loading and unloading the washing machine or the dishwasher. So again, it's that bending and twisting. It's that repetitive movement that we want to try and avoid. So just coming back on to the sleeping as well, which I did forget to mention in terms of pillows, we normally recommend you can try and put a pillow between your knees. This improves the position of the hip rather than bringing the knee lower down than the hip. So we want it to be in a good alignment. Now, for some people, this doesn't actually improve their pain. And if anything, it's more of a nuisance. So if it doesn't help, you don't have to use it. But it is something that a lot of people do find is more comfortable um, and it's something that you can just try, maybe try um, a, a thinner pillow or just the duvet between the knees is sometimes enough. So there are a few options there. So just moving on to exercise. So there's a lot of women that I meet 
that either will push on through and do a lot of exercise, they're normally very active and they'll push on through regardless. But there are also some women that are a bit worried about pain and worried about exercising, so they really reduce what they would normally do. Um, and the real answer is to try and find that in between. So we want to keep you relatively active. That's going to keep your muscles strong. That's going to keep your joints supple and it's going to keep you mentally in a, in a good place. However, we need to make sure that we're not pushing through too much and causing more pain. And we don't want to be resting too much while we do come a bit deconditioned. So it's recommended that women that are pregnant or in the postnatal period should do at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic style activity per week. So this can be walking, running, swimming, cycling, whichever kind of gets your, your heart rate up and makes you a little bit out of breath. And this is perfectly safe to do so unless you have been told by your healthcare provider that you shouldn't be doing this. Now you need to try and make sure that you spread this out during the week. So 150 minutes will be broken down into five lots of 30 minutes. So that might be something that you can fit in. So either going for a lunchtime walk or maybe you do a slightly walk, longer walk at the weekend, but have more breaks in, in between. So what is also important is if it is too uncomfortable, then you need to try and exercise within your pain threshold. So it doesn't mean not exercising at all, but it just means reducing possibly the endurance. So how far you're walking and also the speed that you're walking. So you might need to take shorter steps and you might need to walk a bit slower than normal, or you may just have to reduce how long you walk for. So just bear those things in mind. So other exercises that aren't cardiovascular are kind of general strengthening type exercises that we normally recommend. Now I've mentioned before about the transverse abdominis muscle. Now this is the deep tummy muscle, which is also referred to as your core. Now this is really important as it supports your lower back and this really has to work hard to keep, your, keep yourself upright and it's a real fundamental muscle in preventing pain or improving pain. And there's a number of different ways that you can exercise this muscle. So as you can see in the picture below, there are some really good uses from, from a birthing ball or a Pilates ball, whichever you'd like to call it. Um, it's not necessary that you need to have one of these, but there are, in pregnancy it's quite a lot of exercises that you might find it useful for. So being in this position, either over a ball or over a chair, it doesn't really matter, or into all fours is a really nice one to kind of get into. It takes some of the pressure off your lower back and it helps to relax some of those muscles. So it's a nice resting position, but it's also a very good position for strengthening your muscles. So what you can do in this position is activate your core muscles by imagining that you're doing on a tight pair of jeans or some people like to imagining that they're hugging their baby from the inside and that just gets those muscles wakening up, gets them working a little bit. You can also do other exercises like pelvic tilting in this position. So this is arching your back upwards towards the ceiling and then sinking back down. Um, but also you can do some just deep breathing, relaxation and some pelvic floor exercises, which I'm going to go into and cover in the next couple of slides. So as well as doing some core strengthening, as you can see, there's a few suggestions here. So the two exercises on the ball are different forms of pelvic tilting. So the one on the top left is a forwards and backwards rocking motion of your pelvis. You may be aware of this exercise or have heard this being mentioned. And in the bottom right, there's a side to side motion of the pelvis. So those are very, very good for pelvic pain. Um, and we recommend that you can do them a couple of times a day or even just once a day. And you can do it on a normal chair, but it's not quite as easy. The picture in the middle with the arching and hollowing of the back is the cat cow pose. Again, 
very safe in pregnancy and can be really nice for relieving back pain, but also for strengthening your core muscles. And then as well as doing some strengthening exercises, some stretches is also very important. So the one on the bottom left, this is going to stretch some of the muscles within your buttock region. They quite often become very overworked and very tight. So this is quite a nice position um, to be in to try and release those muscles. And then the top right, again, the muscles at the front of the hip and the front of the pelvis can also get very tight. So this is a really nice stretch just to stretch those out. So make sure that you're not forgetting the stretches as well as the kind of strengthening exercises. So we're just going to move on to the pelvic floor now. So a lot of women I speak to do know about the pelvic floor, but they maybe don't know what its function is or how they should exercise it or how often. But the majority of people have heard about it. Now, we do often think about muscles at the front of the tummy, so your core and the muscles at the back, but the pelvic floor can sometimes get a little bit neglected. So as you can see in the picture, it's, it's basically a sling or a bowl of muscles that attach onto the coccyx at the back and then attach onto the pubic bone at the front. And it's got a few different functions. So one of the main functions is to hold your pelvic organs and support them in place. So your bladder, your bowel and your uterus. It's also really important to prevent leakage of urine and of faeces from the back passage. So if you do have any accidents or you're noticing any leaking, this could be a sign that your pelvic floor is a little bit weak. But we will go through how you can strengthen it. If your pelvic floor is weak, you may notice that there are some pain in that region. So you may feel that some pain is actually quite internal and you really find it hard to pinpoint where it is. And this can be due to the pelvic floor being overworked and being weak. So generally speaking, so pelvic floor exercises are one of the best things you can do to prevent any of those symptoms. So like I said, it's a group of muscles that holds your bladder and your bowel and your uterus in a good position. And you've got some endurance muscles. So these muscles work so you can hold on if you need to go to the toilet. And then you've got the ones that act very quickly. So if you were to cough or sneeze, they activate and contract very quickly to stop any leaking. Now, I understand that it's a common thing that women who are pregnant will have some leakage with coughing and sneezing or jumping and lifting. And it's very common, but it's not a normal thing. And actually, it's something that we should address. So if you are having any of these symptoms, I would urge you to start exercising the pelvic floor um, throughout pregnancy. It's perfectly safe to do and also after you've had the baby. So the way to do it, so you can do it in most positions, but the easiest position um, I normally find and women normally suggest is better for them is in a seated position. So make sure that you're finding a really good posture like we spoke about before. And you want to imagine that you're stopping yourself from passing wind. So you should feel a squeeze and lift and a tightening sensation around the back passage and around the vagina area. Now, it's important not to hold your breath when you're doing these, that you continue to breathe. But you want to try and aim to hold for 10 seconds if you can and repeat this 10 times. Now, that's actually very difficult. So if you can just start off by doing five second holds five times and build up, then that's a really good starting point. So as well as doing these holding ones, we also want to do these quick pulses. So we want to do a squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax, up to 10 repetitions. And then the advice is to do them a minimum of three times a day. Um, there is an app that you can use. Um, which is on one of the last slides, um, which can help with sending you alarms and reminders um, to do these exercises. But it is something that you should consider doing. Um, and if you are already doing it, then that's great. So key points to remember. So pacing of activities, I did mention this before. So 
quite common women will say I'm having a good day, so I'm going to clean the whole house. And then they're struggling for two, three days afterwards. And they have this pattern where they're booming and busting. So they're having this wave that goes up and down of pain. Now, what we want to try and see is a more even line where you might be having a good day and then you don't overdo it. You don't do too much. And then the next day you're also having quite a good day and then you don't overdo it. So trying to spread out those activities so you're not doing lots in one go and then you're having episodes of not being able to do as much. So really try and think about splitting your day up. Think about the activities that might aggravate your pain and spread them out during the week. Really important to wear good footwear. They need to be supportive. Um, they need to make sure that you're not wearing a very high heel. Some people will continue to wear them. Um, and also in the summer weather, the flip flops aren't great for supporting. Um, but I understand some women really struggle with swelling and may not be able to get normal footwear on. But whatever goes on at the foot will have a knock on effect with the knee and the hip and with the lower back. So if you can wear something that's giving you good support around the arch and around the heel, then that's normally a good starting point. It's what we would recommend. Avoid lifting and twisting. So like those activities I spoke about before, try not to do repetitive twisting, loading movements. Try not to rush to just slow yourself down a little bit and accept help when offered. And I don't think as women generally, we're not very good at doing that. We would tend to just soldier on, carry on going. But actually, it's OK to accept help. We can't do everything ourselves. And that's OK if it means that your pain is going to be more manageable for you. If you're still um, are working at the moment, if you are working from home or you have a desk based job, it's important to look at your workstation and see how you're sitting, how your desk is positioned, how your keyboard's positioned and um, look at all of this just to make sure that the things we spoke about with how you're sitting, you're actually fulfilling that when you're at work also. And try and get up and move around as often as you can to try and stop yourself from being in one position and stiffening up and becoming sore. So if pain doesn't improve with these self-help help measures, then I would advise you to speak to your GP or your midwife and they can refer you to see one of us, so one of the physios. And ideally, if you can get this done sooner rather than later, it's usually a little bit better. If things don't start to improve within a few weeks, then maybe speak to them and see if they can refer you. So after everything that we spoke about, we do like to um, give you some things to look out for. Now, anybody that has back pain, we do let them know of this, whether they're pregnant or not. And these are things that are a little bit more concerning. And I think just to add in, it's actually very, very uncommon. But we do want to kind of make sure that you're aware of what signs and symptoms that we don't like to hear about. We don't like to see. So difficulty using or controlling your bladder or your bowels. Now, this might be something that you are experiencing down to pelvic floor weakness. But the thing that we want to watch for is if you're having sudden loss of control of your bladder, so you're not aware that you need to go to the toilet and it's just coming out. And the same with the bowels. So you have no awareness or you can't hold a stool in. It's just coming out. You'd normally be quite alarmed at these symptoms. So these are things to look out for. Any numbness in the saddle region, so this is the region between your legs, so in between your back passage, around the genitals, around to the front passage. So when you're wiping and you feel like it feels numb and you can't feel the tissue paper, again, this is something that isn't normal that we'd we'll like to get investigated. Any reduced sensation during intercourse. So again, any numbness vaginally, internally that you're noticing, so you don't have the same sensation, again, is something to watch out for. Any numbness, pins and needles and weakness going down both legs. And this is normally a new sign that comes on. If it comes on out of the blue, then you need to speak to somebody. 
Um, so either someone in maternity triage or speak to your GP if you just get those symptoms. And then if you have any difficulty in controlling your legs, so you feel like they don't belong to you or you're tripping up and catching your feet and you feel like you're walking like you're drunk. Again, these are things that we, we want to know about and these are things that you should look out for. Now, if you do experience any of these symptoms, then definitely speak to the Maternity Assessment Centre. But if you definitely have any changes in your bladder or bowel control or any numbness in the back passage region, then you should go straight to A&E. If you've got any concerns whatsoever about any of these, then again, I would go to A&E or speak to 111. You need to get some um, medical help or some advice quite quickly. And just finally, just coming on to what we can do to help. So if you were to come and see us in physio, the things that we can do a little bit differently. So not all of the exercises I've kind of recommended will help everybody. So what we would do is look at a tailored individual exercise programme um, that would kind of allow and fit in with what your current function is and your limitations and also what symptoms you're having. Some manual therapy techniques can be useful to address some joint stiffness and muscle tightness. We can give you guidance to progress your exercises if things are improving or regress them if they're too difficult and actually are giving you more pain and irritating your joints and your ligaments. And if things are really quite severe and nothing's really helping, then we can provide walking aids um, to help with that. So I'm just going to finish off. There's a few resources here, so I will pop them in the chat at the end. Um, so one is the squeezy app that I spoke about with the pelvic floor. There is the NHS website on exercise and pregnancy and then the POGP website, um, which is to do with um, obstetrics and gynaecology and physiotherapy. And some really good resources on there, some really good leaflets about pelvic girdle pain, um, but also postnatal exercise. Um, if you have a separation of your tummy muscles, so there's quite a lot of information there. So thank you very much for attending today and I'd welcome any questions. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Mal. And I think um, everyone will agree that was really, really informative. Um, so we have got a few questions for you. Okay. Um, so the first question is, will having pelvic girdle pain affect labour and delivery? So generally speaking, um, no. So there is no reason for somebody to not have a vaginal delivery solely based on having pelvic pain. So there are normally other factors involved if you were to go to a caesarean. And also you've got to think about the recovery from a caesarean. We're cutting through some of the muscles, so actually it can delay recovery. So we do try and promote a, a normal natural vaginal delivery if we can. Now what you can do is, is measure your your pain free range of movement of your hips. And this is something you could discuss with your um, midwife. This is something that you can put in your birthing plan. So it's measuring when you're lying on your back, when your knees are bent, if you can get your birthing partner or somebody to measure the space between your knees. So you bring your knees out to the side as far as you can comfortably go measure that distance with a tape measure and that can be that your comfortable kind of range. Um, now it doesn't always mean that the midwives and the doctors will stick by and never take you past that range but it's something that they will consider and bear in mind when either doing examinations or when trying to deliver your baby. But it does mean obviously in if it's a, an obstetric emergency then they may not be able to follow that. But generally speaking, you should still be, have, be able to have a vaginal delivery. Fantastic. Um, next question, are maternity belts any good for pelvic girdle pain? Um, so the research is very poor on um, how much help they can actually be. Um, and there used to be once upon a time that everyone was given one and that was kind of the treatment. We would give maternity belts out. Um, and I think in my practice, some people find them very, very helpful. 
and some people actually increases their pain. It's not it's not useful at all. Um, so it's worth something that you can try. Um, and it's something that as physios we do sometimes give out to try and help give stability and support to the pelvis. So the other thing that some people might think it does is lifting the bump up, but actually we don't want to do that. We're trying to compress around the pelvis rather than lift and support the bump. So if you have one and it gives you good relief, absolutely carry on using it. Um, but it's not always a rush to go out and buy one. It doesn't always give significant benefit. OK, great. Um, should I bring my maternity notes with me to the physio appointment? Um, so some women do, and I think it's always important to have them on you um, just in case anything was to happen. But we don't routinely write in them. We don't routinely document in them. Um, but if you have any complications during pregnancy and things aren't as straightforward, then by all means bring them along. Or if you've got any questions, we might be able to answer some of the questions that you have um, and go through. If things aren't as straightforward, it might be useful to have some of the information. But on a routine basis, we wouldn't normally ask for them. OK, great. And then the final question. When should I return to exercise after having my baby? Um, so if you've had a normal vaginal delivery, we normally say wait for about three months. So you can do very gentle stuff early on. So I would say have maybe four weeks of where you're not doing too much and you're recovering. You can then start to introduce very gentle exercise. So definitely go out for walks. That's really important. You can do things like Pilates style or yoga style. But anything more energetic or impact, we normally say about three months. Um, in terms of having a cesarean section, things are a little bit longer, obviously, because of the healing process. So for the first six weeks, actually, we don't want you doing too much in terms of um, so strengthening. We don't want to do we can do a little bit of strengthening, but you're not going to be doing lots of sit ups, lots of lifting and um, any kind of running or anything at that stage. Um, so it'll be at least three months plus probably from a cesarean section. But if you've got any concerns, speak to the midwife, speak to your GP, speak to a physio. Fantastic. And that's all the questions. So thank you very much, Mel. And thank You're you everyone welcome. for joining us today.